What's happening? Welcome to Throwing Stones. Alongside Ryan Griffin, I'm Matt Basson. And if you don't know by now, you definitely should know we talk in hoops. And before we get into everything, got to remind you guys to like and subscribe wherever you can find us. That would be Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, full episodes on YouTube, as well as DetroitSportsNation.com. Ryan, uh, we got the NBA Finals kicking off tonight, Thursday, game one in Golden State between the Boston Celtics and the Golden State Warriors. Uh, and we kind of broke that down in our last episode, talking about the offense, talking about the defense, the X factors, the coaching, the experience, all that stuff. So today, let's have some fun. Uh, yesterday, Wednesday, uh, TNT's The Match Volume 6 involved Aaron Rodgers and Tom Brady, the 12s, as I like to call them for this team, versus the young guns of Josh Allen... <laughs> And Patrick Mahomes. Uh, I don't know if you watched it from beginning to end like I did, but uh, the 12s got off to a great start, jumped out two up through two, and then the young cats come fighting back, all the way back, tied it up, took the lead, and this came all the way down to Tom Brady and Aaron Rodgers getting it back to tied with two holes to play. They squared the 11th hole. They only played 12 holes, which I don't understand, if unless it was just because they decided to start so late and they knew they couldn't get 18 in. Because uh, it was rigged for the 12s, right? so they played 12 holes. <laughs> these men, these, these old guys sight getting, the whole time. Yeah, they get, they get, you know, they also get tired as they get older. You know, it's, it's hard to play 18 holes in your 40s. <laughs> but uh, I came down to the last hole, a par three, which. I don't know. I personally don't like that. I would have liked a par five, something with some more interesting uh, situations because the longer the hole, the more chances you have to survive a mistake on a par three. You really don't have a chance to survive a mistake. If your tee shot's not good, you're in a lot of trouble. And uh, for the young guns, Patrick Mahomes couldn't get it done. Josh Allen couldn't get it done. Neither one of them had a great uh, tee shot. And uh, Aaron Rodgers put it to about 15 feet, making a much easier putt. But, Josh Allen, who had a pretty rough day on the course, almost drained about a 70-footer for birdie on the par three, which would have uh, extended the match to a closest to the pin if it would have been tied. But he just missed it, literally left it on the rim of the cup. And after Tom Brady showed Aaron Rodgers the line with his miss, Aaron Rodgers drained the putt for the one-up victory. Uh, every time that we have seen the match so far, it's involved golfers or golfers and NFL players or Charles Barkley because he's Charles Barkley. So it got you and I thinking about, you know, how do we get to have to, one of these with NBA ballers involved in these kind of entertaining matches? Because this is just this is just good television. It's entertaining when you get the right personalities involved. And uh, there's no reason that the NBA can't get involved in something like this. Yeah, there's no reason at all. You got TNT, you already have Barkley baked into it. And then you have, you know, one of the most famous athletes of all time who was trying to be a professional golfer at one point in his career. So we got, you know, I was thinking who would be like the perfect matchup for this hypothetical NBA match that we have going on. And for me, I think two people have to be involved. I think Michael Jordan has to be involved because one, he's a great golfer. Two, he's the greatest basketball player of all time, and he talks a whole lot of crap. And then the second person who has to be involved is Steph Curry because apparently Steph Curry is just like this amazing golfer. If he wasn't so good at basketball, maybe he could, you know, to try his way to get on a PGA if he was, like, focusing all his energy on golf. And then the other two are really kind of up for, you know, d debate, and it's like a wild card toss-up. So I think – because I, I was wrestling with that. I really tried to put a lot of thumb on this. So I think my format would be what uh, Mahomes and Rodgers and uh, Brady and Josh Allen did, is I would pair old guys against young guys. Mm -hmm. So I would have mm -hmm. Michael Jordan be like the captain of his team. And then alongside Michael Jordan, I think I probably ended up going with Larry Bird because Larry Bird's a great golfer. As well, and Larry Bird's a man who, you know, who, who can talk some smack as well. And then on new guys, <laughs> what I would do is I would put Steph Curry, obviously. And then it is a handicap because he's probably not as good as the other guys. I would still put LeBron James so you can have the Michael, you can have the LeBron part of it. And here's like what, you know, what I was thinking about is if 
you were going to tell LeBron you were going to do this match, I don't know how far ahead they set it up, let's say it's a year in advance, hey, we want you to do it on this November or this June, Wednesday, whatever it is. If LeBron's mm-hmm. not very good at golf, he would most certainly go out and get golf lessons so that he's not looking like a bum ass on national television. And he would, again, get to go against Michael Jordan, and he would probably try and one-up him. And I guarantee LeBron would have the farthest drives so that maybe you can just let Steph carry you on your short game, and LeBron, maybe he can help out uh, on the green a few times. But I want to see LeBron bombs from the tee. I want to see him talking trash. Him and Jordan just going back and forth on something that's not basketball-related. It probably ends up diving into into basketball a little bit with how much both of these guys would just be jawing at each other. Steph is probably the best golfer out of them all and the, the least talker, I would say. But I bet he would get into it if Larry Bird started to – to jaw him a little bit. So for me, it's I can't lose television, and I would have Jordan and Larry Legend, and then I would have Steph and LeBron, and those would be my matchups. So I went looking into this as well, and I was thinking about different formats, because this didn't start, obviously, with two football players against two football players. It started with golfers. It was Tiger and, and Phil, a one-on-one shot, but then it became, let's give them teammates. And so then you started getting football teammates. You had Tom Brady and Peyton Manning involved, and eventually it just became the football players. So I think you'd have to probably start by getting a PGA player on each side with an NBA player on each side, and I think it'd be a lot of fun to have it be Jordan and Steph just because they are two phenomenal basketball players who are also two very good golfers but if we are going with just straight NBA players playing golf I mean first of all there's a great story obviously with J.R. Smith you know retiring from the NBA going back to college and playing collegiate golf uh, for I think it's North Carolina A&T I'm pretty sure that's who he's playing for Um, and he has flat out said that Steph Curry is the best golfer in the NBA, which means he's a better golfer than J.R. Smith, who's currently playing at a collegiate level. According to different sources, Steph is basically a scratch handicap. Uh, Michael Jordan, they say, is a one. I've seen Michael Jordan golf multiple times in person because he did it up in Santa Barbara, where my family is from and has lived. Uh, And if he's a one, I haven't seen it. (laughs) Okay, But that's neither here nor there. Um, so he's yeah. like Trump on the golf course. He'd just be lying. <laughs> Not quite that bad, but yeah. Um, Larry Legend, you know, they say he's a single-digit handicap as well. Uh, and, you know, when it comes to, you know, straight comedy and the trash talking, you're not going to find anyone better. You know, Larry Bird. He's golfing be- in Space Jam. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, and so, but I was also looking, there's a couple others, you know, so Clay Thompson is a single-digit handicap. So maybe you have the Splash Brothers on one team. And you get Steph and Clay going up. Now, it'd be great if LeBron was a good golfer because how much fun would it be to have Steph and Clay on one side and LeBron and J.R. Smith on the other? And you get the <laughs> Cleveland Cavalier and Golden State Warrior kind of rivalry going on, uh, which would be a lot of fun. LeBron has played golf. They don't show a handicap for him. I don't think he plays that much. He obviously knows how to, but it takes a lot of work to become a very good golfer. It's a different game uh, golf than the other. Big. Uh, but so I think the Splash Brothers versus would be a fun one. Ray Allen is a very good golfer. CP3 is a very good golfer. Uh, so maybe you have a guards situation where, uh, you know, you have the older guard of CP3 and Ray Allen against the Splash Brothers or against, you know, Steph Curry and whoever. But the legends obviously are going to bring the attention to it. If you have Michael Jordan's name on there, you have Larry Bird's name on there, you have Steph Curry's name on there it's going to garner attention and you're going to garner ratings in that, in that fashion. And of course, having Charles Barkley involved is a must. I don't, I don't mean playing. He doesn't have to play just involved the commentary, the comedy, you know, this, this last show where they had it with him and JJ Watt and they're going at it and they're putting inside bets about playing each other, which was, which was a riot as well. It's, it's, it's great entertainment. It's great you know, some good golf as well. I mean, Aaron Rodgers hit some fantastic shots. You know, Patrick Mahomes hit some bombs, you know, and then Josh Allen, you know, struggled for the most part, uh, hit a couple spectators, gave away a few signed gloves to say, I'm sorry for hitting you with a golf ball at 60 miles an hour. Uh, But it was, it was good golf mixed throughout and uh, very entertaining. And, you know, I think the NBA getting involved in this would be a very smart move. Yeah, I want Shaq uh, on the commentary too. Him and him and Charles. Man, Charles, 
I know it's all tongue in cheek, but anytime he gets the rip on Shaq with Shaq not being there, Charles doesn't miss. <laughs> he comes right for him. You know, he's talking about how his life is so much better when Shaq's not around. And <laughs> anytime he gets a break from that seven foot fool, it's a great day for him. <laughs> He doesn't miss a chance to absolutely take a shot at a man that would destroy him if he ever felt like it. Because we know Shaq, if he ever felt like it, Charles Barkley's world is over. But thankfully, they're actually friends and are, you know, don't don't take anything to heart. Yeah, well, they fought that one time in the actual NBA. Uh, well, when, where Chuck Barkley threw, threw, a, Chuck ball threw a ball at him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a good thing Chuck knows how to bob and weave, man. Because Shaq was coming with that left hand. But I, I want to see it, and honestly, one day I think we will see something like it. <sighs> where, like, where you know, where the NBA ends up getting involved. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but yeah, there's. I mean, just in general, other sports. I mean, you know, there there are plenty in baseball. There's actually contracts where you can't. A lot of hitters, you can't <laughs> play golf. You know, because it messes up your baseball swing. So generally, the good golfers in baseball are pitchers because they're not hitting anyway for the most part. And so there are a lot of great pitchers out there that are also great golfers. John Smoltz is a single-digit handicap and a Hall of Famer. Uh, you know, so you could definitely get baseball involved as well. I don't know so much about hockey. Have no idea who out there on the on the you know on the ice is also good on the links. But just other sports in general, you know, there's no reason you couldn't have big names get involved in this. That's that's a great thing about golf is you know. In the off season, there's no reason they couldn't come and do this. And you know, money for charity, obviously feeding America, and a number of uh, you know the number of meals that were provided through this. Uh, the, it's 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 a good thing for that. It's great for television for us, the fans. You know, golf fans love it. You know, sports fans in general love it. Even if you don't like golf, you're perfectly fine watching your favorite athlete from another sport come and play this game. Uh, so. This this should only get bigger and better, I think. I think TNT has kind of hit the nail on the head with the match, and, you know, the NBA has to find a way to get involved. Yep. Jordan and Jordan Larry. <laughs> all right, so back to the big news. Uh, game one, NBA Finals. And uh, we've done all the, all the legwork, and we've made our predictions. Uh, we've talked about how hard it is to really predict this Finals oh. and really excited to see how this Finals is going to go. Uh, you saw, uh, you saw Ice Cube's son <laughs> doing a, a Game of Thrones kind of, you know, <laughs> bending the knee to the brothers of the North and praying for them to take care of their biggest rival because us Laker fans and us Piston fans, y'all, y'all are rooting for the Celtics to live in Detroit. There's something wrong with you. You're either really, really young or there, there's something missing up here because there's no reason for a Detroit Piston fan to root for the Boston Celtics in any way, shape, or form. So the Laker fans, you know, they don't love the Golden State Warriors. A lot of their Fairweather fans went to the Warriors and became Warrior fans once Kobe went down and the Lakers started sucking. They kind of followed suit up and went up north uh so they have their own little rivalry but it's not nearly as big as the 50 plus years of rivalry between the boston celtics and the la lakers so uh, o'shea jackson jr uh kind of bending the knee and <laughs> praying for his brothers up north to take down our biggest rival the boston celtics which is just fantastic but uh thinking about this and you know there's there's some big names uh in these nba finals you know up and comers like jason tatum and jalen brown uh some you know some guys who have already made their mark in Steph Curry, uh, Draymond Green, Clay Thompson, but specifically Steph Curry, you know, when you're talking about the, you know, the greatest of all times and where are they going to have their legacy finish up and all that Steph's the one out of these guys that's going to have that conversation. Uh, you know, he's been called the greatest shooter for the last three, four years now. Uh, you know, but to, you know, add to that and, you know, be in the top 20 all time, top 15, all time, top 10, all time, wherever you want to end up putting him, where does a fourth NBA championship, which ties him with LeBron, a finals MVP, which he does not have yet, what does, in your mind, Ryan, what does that do for Steph's legacy? To me, it would put him really kind of in the spot that I already have him. So if I'm just looking at point guards and you and I did our top five point guards list, to me, Steph Curry is already the second best point guard of all time. And some other names that we both threw in that mix were Isaiah Thomas, uh, Oscar Robertson, you know, a guy like uh, John Stockton, too. And to me, if Steph has a fourth ring, which would be two more than Isaiah, and if he gets a finals MVP, which would tie 
you know, Isaiah, because Isaiah didn't win uh, both MVPs that the, the Pistons won. Um, it'd be more rings than, obviously, Oscar Robertson has as well. I I just think it's inarguable at that point that he'd be the second greatest point guard of all time, and he'd be the second best winner that we've ever had at point guard of all time because then you have, you know, Magic Johnson, um, who has five, and I'm sure whoever Bill Russell's point guard was probably has about eight, but we're not we're not talking about him. We're talking about guys who are actually in the conversation of, of – yeah, they're all Bob Cousy. J.J. Reddick is just like a plumber. So they're all Bob Cousy. Didn't win nothing until Bill Russell came there. So, we're, like, those are the, the class of guys that we're talking about. And, to, again, to me, Steph's already number two, but I don't see how this wouldn't make it inarguable if he was number two. And then where you start ranking him on the all-time list, I don't know exactly what number. I've heard people say 10, but, like, 10 a very short list, and it gets filled up very, very fast. Mm-hmm. And then just, you know, who are you taking out? Are you taking out a guy like Larry Bird who – has three titles and then if Steph gets a fourth or he taken out, you know, Shaq, which it seems like absurd if you just think about it. But Steph's probably in that conversation. He's probably on the outside of it, of it to me. And then I think you start looking at where he ranks generation wise. Like he's not going to rank ahead of LeBron, obviously, but then he could very well be number two. You know, he could surpass Durant if you don't think he surpassed Durant already because then he would have led two teams, not on his own, but he would have led two teams as the best player to uh, uh, NBA championship without having a stacked team, right? Durant obviously had to team up with Steph and Clay and Draymond to win his two. Wasn't able to get it done in Oklahoma City. Hasn't been able to get it done in Brooklyn yet. And, of course, time will tell as that goes on if – you know, if that's going to end up happening. But Steph will have led, you know, the most impressive dynasty of his era, which I think counts for something. And then he'll have four titles, two as the best player on a championship team that's, like, not a super team, Mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Because Durant obviously won it as the best player, but he had a super team in Durant's talent. He's still probably a better individual talent than Steph Curry is. But if Steph gets this fourth ring and then if he gets the finals MVP with it, I think you really have to start looking at him as somebody that you'd rather have on your team than Kevin Durant. So let's talk about that super team thing. Because the only thing that differentiates what you're saying as far as a super team was whether or not Kevin Durant was on that team. So what made it a super team for you? Was it just adding Kevin Durant to a team that was organically made for the most part, as far as the stars were concerned or what, what differentiates? I mean, it's having from not. It's having like two of the best, like 15 players of all time and already having a championship team, adding Kevin Durant to it. You know, it's four hall of famers on one team, essentially. Right. (laughs) <laughs> I hear you. It's it's funny because you know we, we, when we talk about the super teams, every team we talk about with super teams have been teams that have not been made through the draft. They've been made by adding pieces. So you know the the you know the Heatles, where you added you know LeBron James and Chris Bosh to Dwayne Wade's team. Uh, you know the, the Ray the, Allen and Shane Bay. Yeah, the big three. You know in uh, in Boston, where you added KG and Ray Allen to Paul Pierce and those Boston Celtics, uh, you know, the, the, the super team that failed in the, you know, the Oh four Lakers where you added Gary Payton and Carl Malone to Shaq and Kobe Shaq and Kobe alone wasn't considered a super team. Even though the Lakers added Shaq, they didn't have anybody yet. They had just drafted Kobe. So they didn't know what he was going to be. They thought that he was going to end up becoming great, but it wasn't a super team yet. Uh, so it wasn't, you know, but, and then you look at the Warriors and with Steph Clay and Draymond, the, you know, the core of that Warriors team that was done organically. They drafted each of those players. They were lucky that those players turned out to be what they ended up becoming. You didn't know for sure. They didn't add them through, you know, later on by trading away for a team, you know, or just signing them in the off season, like they did with Kevin Durant. And then the whole narrative flipped once Kevin Durant went over to that Golden State Warriors team. Yeah, and I think, you know, part of it, especially with Shaq, is the Lakers weren't great when they added him. Certainly not. And then they weren't, you know, even great yet. They didn't win their first title to 2000. And they added Shaq in, what, like 96? Mm-hmm. So uh, I think with the Warriors, too, you know, what I guess what part partly makes that a super team is the fact that, or, you know, that they had a super team was 
it's because they both they had both Stephen Durant. I think if you just looked at a team that had Kevin Durant, Clay Thompson, and Draymond Green, you wouldn't call that a super team. They'd be a really good team, mm-hmm. but I don't think anybody would be saying that's a super team or that's unfair to the rest of the league like they were when Kevin Durant joined a team who had set the regular season's win record and then the year prior had won like I think sixty five games or something and then and then won the NBA title with it. So. That uh, t- to me, like those Warriors teams were kind of inarguably the super teams, and then uh, no, I think what they're doing now is a little bit more organic because they've gotten con- contributions from guys that they have drafted, uh, Jordan Poole, Jonathan Kaminga, Kevon Looney, and then they've added guys like Iguodala and uh, and Andrew Wiggins, but. I mean, again, I think we mentioned it last week. Andrew Wiggins, adding Andrew Wiggins doesn't make you a super team at all. No, even though you've added... Or, you know, something even close to it. And then, so for me, I think, you know, you start to put Steph in, like, this this class that, like, I don't know, like Tim Duncan is in, where he's maybe the best teammate ever in terms of not caring or sacrificing, like, what might be better for his individual numbers or individual performance for team success. And a guy that you've never heard any type of like controversy about a guy who you haven't heard ever really bad mouth this team in any way. And I think him and Duncan are probably the only two guys that we can ever say that about. And then if Steph gets four rings, you know, that'll be close to what Duncan has with five. But, and he ain't done. <laughs> if they get this fourth one, you know, there's no reason to no. think that this team couldn't be back here next year or the year after that or yes. the year after that. It's, it's not a swan song by, no, by, by any means. means. Um, yeah, see, it, it's weird for me with Steph. The point guard list, you know, when you sent that to me, you know, I, I, you know, going through it, I, you, if you look at my list, you know, outside of Oscar Robertson, who played in a totally different era, so he's averaging, you know, damn near 30 points while getting triple doubles and all that. But everyone else in that list, Isaiah Thomas, John Stockton, you know, Magic Johnson, they are traditional point guards. Now, Isaiah was a great scorer who didn't utilize his scoring as much as he obviously could have because those Pistons teams were such a complete team in every sense of the word when it came to spreading the ball around, spreading the scoring around. But Isaiah was absolutely the general and the field general of that team. Uh, Magic Johnson, obviously, you know, could score and could have scored a heck of a lot more than he did. You know, you look at his shooting percentages, they are literally the exact same shooting percentage as Larry Bird, one of the greatest scorers in NBA history in most people's minds. So (laughs) there's no reason to think Magic couldn't keep doing that as well. He didn't have to, didn't want to, you know, until he was forced to kind of by Pat Riley, where you finally told him you need to take these games over more offensively and not just be averaging 10 to 15 assists a game like Magic was able to do. Uh, So when I look at Steph, it's season two of Showtime. It's uh yeah right. Uh, it's a money time. My bad. It's such a it's such a great situation for Steph to be in to have Draymond Green, to have a point forward who can bring the ball up, who can get you seven, eight, nine, ten assists in a game without really much issue, uh, and generally does that, and it allows Steph to not have to be a traditional point guard. And he's able to be more of that scoring point guard and really be the offense and the engine that runs the team in that manner. So Steph is very lucky that Draymond turned into what Draymond turned into. Draymond is very lucky that he was a part of a team with Steph and Klay Thompson. There's a lot of luck involved in who your teammates are and how it works out and how the team meshes together and all that. I'm not taking anything away from Steph Curry. He's a fantastic basketball player and one of the best I've ever seen, especially at shooting. So when I look at the point guard list, it's hard for me to put Steph where because this is positionless basketball now on a lot of these teams and the Golden State Warriors are very much that. Uh, But just as far as Steph's legacy of having four NBA championships, having that finals MVP finally, because look, good luck finding a better stat line as far as modern basketball is concerned. I don't know if you want to go back to the 60s and all that. I'm not going to. But as far as modern basketball is concerned, go look at the, I think it's the second uh, finals MVP for Kevin Durant, right? Where Steph averaged 29 points along with all of his other stats, where he had a real yeah, argument. Yeah, like 9 and 8. Yeah. Like, like he, he almost averaged a triple-double, honestly. Like his, his numbers are absolutely <laughs> ridiculous, and he doesn't win finals MVP. And if all you did was look at his numbers and say, how the hell did this man not win finals MVP? 
But then you go look at Kevin Durant's numbers, and he averaged like 31 to Steph's 29, and he averaged, I think, double-digit rebounds to go along with it. You know, you understood why it went to Kevin Durant. But good luck finding a player with stats like Steph that didn't win finals MVP on the winning team. We're not going to count LeBron James and all of his numbers when he's doing everything for the Cavaliers but losing the NBA Finals. But just looking at Steph and where he is as far as legacy is concerned, I mean, he's already... What top twenty five? I would think, right? Yeah, I, I mean, I'd probably have him top twenty, but yeah. Okay, but let's it, be safe. The list fills up fast, like we yeah, said. It really does. <laughs> you start going like, okay, where does this guy go? Where does that guy go? Um, but so when you start talking yes, about top twenty 10, guys that are top ten, like right, like it's really hard to make a top ten. You're gonna have your own personal biases in there. There are plenty of reasons to not have Kobe Bryant in the top ten. There are a thousand reasons to have Kobe Bryant in the top 10. There's plenty of reasons to not have Shaq in the top 10. You know, in a lot of people's minds, he's not even the second greatest center in NBA history. And then you've got the small forwards, the power forwards, the shooting guards, the point guards to get involved in these top 10s as well. So it's so hard to make that list. But if Steph has four NBA finals championships and finally a finals MVP to go with it, and two MVPs. And two MVPs. Like regular first, MVPs. Yeah, regular MVPs and the first unanimous MVP. And the greatest three-point shooter of all time, probably the greatest shooter of all time, which is a big part of basketball, obviously. It it just gets so convoluted of who do you kick out to move Steph in? And it's you're, you're going to end up having fights. The old heads are going to have their yeah. fights about their guys <laughs> in the 70s and the 80s. Uh, and then the 90s guys are going to have their fights as well. And then the early 2000s guys are going to have their fights as well. Like, it's so hard to pick. But he is going to absolutely throw his name into that ring of having that battle of who is top 10 when it's all said and done. Because, look, spoiler alert for me personally, I don't think Steph's going to stop at four. Jeez. I don't. God, that'd be insane. I think he... <laughs> I think he'll end up tying Magic, you know. I think he'll end up tying Kobe. I think he'll end up tying Tim Duncan. I think he'll probably have five by the time his career is. There's no reason to think this Warriors can't do it. The only reason the Warriors haven't been involved these last two years is because of injuries. So if they can stay healthy going forward, Steph's not that old. Clay's not that old. Draymond's not that old. Steve Kerr, definitely not that old for an NBA coach. And now you just got these young guys you just talked about, Jonathan Kaminga and Moses Moody. You know, J- J- you know, Jordan Poole just came out of nowhere. If they keep Andrew Wiggins and his ascension continues, there's no reason to think these Golden State Warriors are not going to be a team to deal with for the next three, four, five years. Yeah, I mean, they're really – obviously, they're really good. And the only thing you'd say about the Warriors is what people are already saying, and that's proven to be wrong because – here they are, uh, hour and twenty minutes away from tipping off. You know, a game one of another NBA Finals is eventually they're going to get too old, and then they're going to break down. But like you said, they have these young pieces who can try and like ride it out into the sunset. You know, a lot like again, we mentioned Tim Duncan, a lot like Kawhi Leonard was for Tim Duncan. And what I think the Warriors, I think the Warriors can do it and can keep this up. Uh, it's just a matter of can they stay healthy and really for Steve Kerr, because I know he's got that like back thing. So you mentioned he's not that old for an NBA coach, but he's already had to like take real big portions of this of seasons out to deal with whatever is ailing his back. So I wonder if that might cut his coaching career short. You're right, though. They have a lot of young talent and they even have got, you know, they have a guy like, uh, like James Wiseman, who's been riddled by injuries, is still a chance he could pop. You know, I'm not, I'm not calling it. I'm not saying he's going to be the next, you know, DeAndre Ayton or Amari Stoudemire or whatever. But like, <laughs> like he's still the the books yet to be written on him. And that's another guy that the Warriors can, you know, utilize whether it's on the court. Or if he shows them something this next year, he's a potential trade asset. You know, they still have, like, uh, Wiggins' big contract. They have their two young guys. So even if they wanted to ride it out with all these young pieces, or if they saw an opportunity next year for a star to come available. And they're like, oh, like, there's Bradley Beal, or maybe someone even a little bit better than Bradley Beal, because Beal's going to be making, I think, like $50 million a year, and the Warriors might not want to pay him all that money. Um, But, you know, 
Zion, say Jokic gets mad in Denver or something. And I'm not saying any of these things are going to happen, but if that does happen, we've seen that that is also a proven way to win an NBA title because it's a lot of it's how a lot of the titles up to this one have been won the last couple of years in the NBA is by gathering these stars together and putting them on the court and praying they're healthy. And if they're healthy, you got a you got a contender at least and a pretty good shot to win a title. And the Warriors can really go whatever way they want to go. It's an excellent spot for them to be in. And, you know, I I don't know that the over-under, if they get, like, this title is, you know, one one more, right? Would you go under? Would you go over? Would you go under? I don't know. But they're certainly, you know, this, again, it's certainly not a swan song for them. This isn't their last fight, and I expect them to be contending for more titles uh, definitely in the next few years while they still have their, their three core and then as their young players continue to grow. Ryan, what, what was the uh, the first nickname of the first uh, Warriors championship team of this group? Do you remember? Uh, it was on their shirts. Know. It was a slogan Rise they up, had. I no Strength in numbers. Okay. And who, ah. who did Steve Kerr learn really learn coaching from? It was Greg Popovich. Now, the San Antonio Spurs were relevant in the NBA from 1994 until these last couple years where it kind of came to an end. Now, they got lucky. David Robinson got hurt in 1996, and the Spurs were terrible. And they ended up with the number one pick, and they added Tim Duncan. That certainly helps. But from there... It started about adding pieces. You added Tony Parker. You added Manu Ginobili. You added Boris Diaw. You added all these guys, and then you end up adding Kawhi Steven Leonard. Steven Jackson, you know, yeah. Right. <laughs> but it was finding the guys that were going to fill all the holes. It was a strength in numbers approach, and that's where Steve Kerr has kind of learned this from. And he's absolutely taken it to the Golden State Warriors. And you look at the numbers of the guys on the bench and what they do. And you look at the championship teams for the Warriors. And they had the Sean Livingstons. And they had the Andre Godalas. And they have all these guys that would come in and do their job really well and make life easier for the stars of this team to not have to carry it. And you see these young guys we have just talked about, and there's no reason to think that these young guys can't come up in this same role, and they're not going to continue to add these role players who are going to give you anywhere from 8 to 15 points a game and do all the little things to make life easier for your stars. And, yeah, I understand Steve Kerr's got some back issues. Phil Jackson had hip issues forever. They gave him a bigger chair and all that. You can do the same thing for Steve Kerr. Give the man a recliner if you have to. Let him sit back and relax half the game. I don't know. But there's just so much good going for the Golden State Warriors. There isn't a reason to think, as long as they stay healthy, that they can't keep this going for years to come. So that's half of the NBA Finals. The other half is the Boston Celtics. This Boston Celtics team has been fighting and fighting and fighting to get to this level for the last four or five years. Brand new coach in Ime Odoka. He's done a fantastic job and has gotten them to the level where they haven't been to since 2010. As far as the Boston Celtics are concerned, the East has gotten a lot better since LeBron's departure. Uh, it's not an easy slug to make it out of the East like it used to be for LeBron and his team. Uh, but the Boston Celtics have a lot of the right pieces to be right back here next year as well, Ryan. Yeah, and so obviously they're young, they're very cohesive, and they have three guys who are going to be at least on the team for a foreseeable future, and then you have guys who are definitely going to be running it back next year, whether it's Robert Williams or uh, Grant Williams. Um, Derek White probably, I'm not sure, his free agency status. But there's a lot of guys on Celtics that um, to like, and they've been a good team these last couple of years anyway. You know, it's not like they popped up out of nowhere this year and then just decided, hey, we're going to be going to the NBA Finals straight out of nowhere. Uh, I think the thing for really both of these teams is how the NBA landscape looks next year. You know, both these teams probably got helped a little bit by injuries. You know, would Boston be in the situation if – Chris Middleton didn't go down or if Tyler Hero was able to play whatever, you know, there's a lot of NBA champions that you can go back and, and look at that list. So to like project for the future for either of these teams, um, I think it's mostly fair that you project everyone's healthy and then things start to look 
different and the paths start to look harder than maybe they were for this year. But I think regardless of what happens in the East next year, the Celtics will be, you know, they'll be in the mix. They'll be in the conversation because they were in the conversation before this year happened. Yeah, I mean, look, we don't know what's going to happen with Brooklyn. I know that's the one thing that everyone wants to keep their eye on of, you know, you're going to get a full season, hopefully, of Kyrie and KD playing together. And, you know, can they make that team into, you know, what it needs to be? Because everyone talks about, look, if they're both playing at the top of their game, they can beat anybody. Well, we have yet to see it, but it's probably true. (laughs) Kyrie's a hell of a player. KD's one of the best small fours we've ever seen. Uh, one of the best shooters we've ever seen. One Just one of the best offensive players we've ever seen. And when he cares enough to play defense, he's pretty good at that too. He's long as can be and deflects a lot of shots and changes the course of a lot of shots. Uh, he makes up for the fact that he's not that big as far as thickness and got to, you know, you look at how LeBron pushed him around back in 2011. That's not the same KD that we have now. So, or 2012, excuse me. Uh, but, you know, Brooklyn, obviously, Milwaukee, you know, they're not going anywhere. You know, they 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 figured out like the pieces needed along, you know, alongside Giannis and Middleton to make that team a championship team. Miami, you know, they they've got some things to figure out as well. Obviously, health played a big factor in theirs, but their defense is, you know, stifling. And if, you know, Jimmy Butler, for whatever reason, loves to turn it on when it matters more than when regular season. <laughs> uh, and they got a great coach in Eric Spolstra and a great mind behind him in Pat Riley. So there's no reason to think Miami's really going to go anywhere either. It's definitely not an easy road. And it's not an easy road for the Warriors either. You know, the, the Suns have been a, have been, been a very good team. Uh, you know, Dallas, you think, is going to figure things out and give Luka a big along with some other help. Uh, so it's not an easy road, obviously. But if, if you're asking me to predict next year's NBA Finals, I think we're going to see who we're seeing right now. I think we're going to see the Boston Celtics and the Golden State Warriors really? running this back next year. Next, so next year I would in the West. I think I would take the Clippers because I really liked a lot of the moves they made after Paul George went down. And obviously Kawhi Leonard didn't play, but I think Kawhi is still <laughs> you amazing. Silly and rabbit. if you, you think can Kawhi's add, gonna play. yeah, I know. <laughs> well, apparently. <laughs> and then, you know, for the East, same same thing. I, I would take the Nets. I think Ben Simmons really fits in well with Kyrie and Kevin Durant. And I think Kyrie, next year they're not going to have the mandates. I, I don't think they will anyway at the start of the NBA season. So Kyrie's going to be able to play all – well, theoretically he should be able to play all those games that he missed. We'll see if there's a, another excuse that, that comes out the water where he misses, you know – 53 games again or however many he missed this year and Kevin Durant's obviously uh, amazing by himself but you're right there's so much competition at least on paper in both of these conferences where you do out west have the Suns we don't know what's going to happen with you know DeAndre Ayton yet but there's the Suns there's the Clippers who again I think they're real like if Kawhi and Paul George are back it's a really deep team and they probably shouldn't have trouble attracting like free agents or some wily vets to come in there being that they're in LA and then if you have healthy Kawhi and Paul George you know you're going to have a shot at ring not that the Warriors are going to have any trouble with that either if that's the route they decide to go um who else do you have? I mean, you have Memphis, who's on the come up too. You know, John, Jaron Jackson, Desmond Bain. They're bringing, I think, all of those guys back. And then in the East, you mentioned all you mentioned all the teams, and like you still have Philadelphia, where I know what you think of James Harden, but if you have a year of Harden and Embiid, and they can they get a year to figure it out, and then like you still have Tyrese Maxey, uh, like I think that could be a really good team and then you still have doc rivers um who is still a good coach despite you know maybe the sixers have stopped listening to him at this point but he's, he's still a pretty good coach and i just think the competition at least on paper will be tougher but it all comes down to health and certainly the celtics and warriors will be in that mix as long as all those guys stay healthy because we could be looking at back from a year from now and say oh well steph broke his hand again and now the and now the warriors are poop right. so they might not right. not even be in the playoffs like they were the last two seasons. Yeah, we don't know. I don't think it's going to be a, a rematch, though. I don't think either of these teams are going to be back. But if I had to choose one, I'd probably choose the Warriors over the Celtics. I get that. It's just the defense matters to me, and this this defense of the Celtics play is you know really really good. And you saw them come together. Um, to me, it's obviously about about Tatum and Brown and being able to play together 
you know, going forward, you know, they, there's been so much made about how, how do you keep both these guys? It's not working, blah, 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 blah. And then Marcus Smart has his blow up moment with them back in November. And that's when things kind of started to turn around. Uh, you know, we didn't even discuss Minnesota who's on the, you know, the, you know, the up, what, what, what is the word incline? <laughs> um, you know, there, there's definitely contenders out there and it's not going to be an easy road for either team. I just think what each of these teams bring to the table, make it very difficult to knock them out of the postseason. I think the Celtics have figured it out and they have a lot of the right pieces. Al Horford's already guaranteed his contract for next year based off of how he's played in this postseason. season. Uh, that news came out last week. Uh, so he'll be back and he brings a lot to the table as far as what the Celtics need uh, as far as defense defensively and just having that great veteran that's gonna you know he's you know what he's gonna give you and it usually helps you guys win but it's like you said it's it's hard to predict if I was going to make that prediction I I, I like what these two teams have brought to this table this year and I, I don't see it stopping that doesn't mean these other teams that they beat along the way Memphis you know played Golden State really well uh you know Boston obviously had a really hard time with you know with Milwaukee without Chris Middleton. So obviously with him being back, it's going to change things, but it, the whole team changes when you have your second star in there and other guys, you know, might not step up as much as, as, as they did this year with Chris Middleton being out. You never know what you get from the role players. And that plays a big factor in how teams go as well. But there's, there's a lot out there that's going to change how this, you know, how next season is going to look altogether. We're obviously assuming everyone's going to stay healthy. And I just think what the Warriors have from the young guys coming up, you know, and, you know, getting a lot of growth this year in this run and getting to the NBA Finals and seeing what it takes to get there. If they are the right kind of players, they're going to internalize that and, you know, up their game for the next years to come. And these guys are only going to get better. Jordan Poole should only get better. Kaminga and Moody obviously should only get better. Wiseman, like you said, completely forgotten at this point. But, you know, he's a heck of a talent. And if he can put it all together, he can absolutely be a difference maker as well. And, you know, and how East we forgot about Shaden Sharp coming into the Pistons yeah, averaging right. 35 points a game. <laughs> and now him and Kate are the best, you know, duo in the NBA. <laughs> All right. Well, this is going to, you know, our show is going to air after game one. But, you know, you and I talked about it on Tuesday. Uh, have you come off of your stance of thinking that the Warriors should take game one because Gold, uh, the Boston Celtics might be a little worn down from back-to-back seven-game series and, you know, have, haven't had that much time to rest for this game? Does it look like I've come off my stance? No, I don't see it. <laughs> I do not see that at all. All right. Well, by the time we Bet talk to you guys again next week, uh, let's see. Game one is two is Thursday. Game two is Sunday, right? Sunday. We take two days off. Yeah. And uh, game three will be probably Wednesday, right? Because they got a travel day. Yeah, yeah I had the schedule up. I had yeah. the schedule up earlier. <laughs> I'm pretty, I'm pretty yeah, sure only two anymore. games are going to play by the time we talk to you guys in our next show. So, Ryan, after two games, is it tied last one, time one? we said that both series were over right <laughs> is it tied 1-1 one, one or is, is someone up 2-0 i think the warriors will be up 2-0 i mentioned it last show i think it, they'd be very disappointed if they uh weren't up 2-0 so i got i got the warriors taking both the games all right i'm gonna be different just for the sake of being different and say it's gonna be tied 1-1 but i hope you're right <laughs> All right, well, that's going to do it, do it for us on this episode of Throwing Stones. Alongside Ryan Griffin, I'm Matt Bass. And thank you guys for hanging out with us. And uh, we'll see you guys again real soon. Man on a mission, I'm a kid, and you know I be on a way.